All right, here we go. So here we're going to talk about a challenging condition that people were asking me about last night. So the folks were asking me at the, out at the uh, exhibit space, hopefully you're here this morning, you can actually talk to people that really know what they're talking about. Overcoming diagnostic and therapeutic challenges in the individualized management of binge eating disorder. This is a co-presentation talk. Our, our presenters are Carlos Grillo, PhD, who's a professor of psychiatry and the director for the program of obesity, weight, and eating research, and the director of clinical training in psychology at Yale University School of Medicine, and professor of psychology at Yale University, of course, in New Haven. Uh, joined uh, by Leslie Citrome, who's a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at New York Medical College, Valhalla, New York. These gentlemen are world experts in these areas. We're very fortunate to have them. Gentlemen, come on up. It's all yours. Thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here, actually, with Carlos. We've worked together over the years uh, talking about binge eating disorder and providing information about its recognition and its management. This is something that's dear to my heart personally. It's been part of my private practice for close to 30 years, completely by accident. When I started a private practice, I was referred my first patients from uh, two social workers who specialized in eating disorders, and there was no pharmacotherapy then, but they needed someone to uh, attend to their patients' comorbidities. So that's uh, how I spent uh, my time uh, originally in my private practice. So here we are today talking about binge eating disorder. Here are our disclosures. And uh, these slides are available, by the way, through your app as well. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, some agents that are approved and some agents that are not approved. And we've disclosed uh, everything we could think of. And uh, this program has been reviewed. Our learning objectives are to outline the diagnostic criteria that distinguish binge eating disorder from other eating disorders and other potentially problematic conditions, comorbidities, both psychiatric and physical. We're going to evaluate the latest clinical data that uh, tells us, informs us about pharmacotherapies, including mechanism of action, efficacy and safety, and potential impact on long-term outcomes, as well as take a look at uh, other interventions, including CBT, for example, and how to craft all this into an individualized program for someone with binge eating disorder, and do we combine or, or not combine? So we're, we're going to do that. So let's start off with an academic overview of binge eating disorder. What is it? Well, the DSM-5, which formerly included BED uh, as, a, uh, as, a cate as a diagnostic category, uh, defines BD as including recurrent episodes of binge eating. Binge eating uh, requires two components. First, eating in a discrete or uh, reasonably continuous period of time, an amount of food that's larger than what most people uh, might eat or would consider uh, an appropriate amount of food under similar circumstances. And, and this is not an or, this is an and, because a lot of people can overeat, there needs to be a sense of a lack of control over the eating during that episode. So the person feels that they're unable to stop, control, uh, interrupt uh, uh, their eating during that episode. This needs to happen at least once a week uh, over the uh, previous uh, three months. That is a change from the previous uh, research criteria uh, that had a longer uh, duration requirement and a higher frequency requirement. But in a DSM-5, it's once weekly for three months, and then the binge eating itself needs to be associated with market distress for the person. There are some associated features. For example, binge episodes are associated with at least three of the following, eating more rapidly than usual, eating until feeling uncomfortably full, eating large amounts of food even when not being physically hungry, eating alone because of feeling embarrassed by how much one is eating, and feeling disgusted with oneself, depressed or guilty afterwards. And it's really not unusual for all five of these features to be present in a person. The severity itself is primarily anchored on the number of binge episodes during the week. And the levels of severity can range from mild to extreme. However, we can bump this up from mild to moderate, and we often do, depending on other symptoms and functional disability. So someone who has three binge eating episodes per week 
yes, technically mild, but if they have all five of those associated features and they're quite distressed about it, you can bump it up to a moderate because you're going to do an overall global assessment of their severity. But what about some caveats here? Um, BD is one of the broader categories known as eating disorders. And one of the hallmarks for eating disorders uh, is generally that there's a profound uh, disturbance in body image, a profound disturbance in how the person evaluates himself or herself um, unduly based on their ability to control their weight and shape. That is not a requirement for BD. Um, research has found in clinical practice clearly indicates that about half of our patients with BD uh, do experience and suffer from this profound body image uh, dis uh, disturbance, but it is not a requirement uh, for uh, the diagnosis. Just want to circle back to uh, the diagnosis because we talked about what was required for the diagnosis. Uh, there are some important exclusionary um, considerations. Um, BD uh, includes the excess eating while having the loss of control. But if the person engages in inappropriate weight compensatory mecha uh, mechanisms, such as self-induced vomiting, laxative misuse, uh, diuretic misuse, excessive, re re rigorous, vigorous exercise in order to undo the caloric consequences of the binge, then that is an exclusion for binge eating disorder. Those weight compensatory uh, mechanisms are a hallmark of another eating disorder known as bulimia nervosa. And if the person meets criteria for bulimia nervosa, that trumps, if you will, uh, the binge eating uh, diagnosis. The other important thing, if you think back to some of those behavioral indicators, and lots of times all of them are present, one of them is eating alone because of this intense um, embarrassment. And it is a very secretive behavior, um, a high degree of shame and embarrassment about these behaviors, and it's ordinarily not shared with other people. Their partners, their friends, their colleagues, uh, and even their therapists with whom they discuss many things that are sensitive and close to them often don't know uh, that this person might be having these episodes in secret. They have a different life and because it is such a, a uh, source of shame for the person. So the context also is very important. Uh, you know, we, we all sometimes binge, but we don't have a loss of control. So that's not technically a binge episode. Uh, for to, to qualify for binge eating disorder. So an example of this is coming up soon, Thanksgiving, where we eat a, a lot of food, relatively short period of time, but we don't have a loss of control. So that doesn't count. The other caveat is that a binge doesn't have to be all in one setting. You can actually start your binge in the office, on the way home, and then at home. And that the, this eating process uh, continues from location to location. The most important aspect of binge eating is that there's a loss of control. In fact, when you ask patients if the doorbell rings, do you stop what you're doing? And very often, or, or after a little while, or you know, they, they don't immediately cease eating, or if the phone rings, that usually gets ignored uh, for sure. And the types of foods that can be consumed in a binge don't necessarily have to be pizza, french fries, and so on. It could be reasonably healthy foods like fruit and yogurt. As, as long as you're eating more of it than you had planned to and loss of control while eating, that counts. The etiology of binge eating disorder is quite complex. We don't know for sure, but we know it involves primarily dysregulation in the reward center and impulse control circuitry. We know that it likely involves uh, the dopamine signaling pathways of wanting food and endogenous mu opioid pathways uh, that uh, signal liking food. And there's also an interplay between genetics, of course, and environmental stressors. There are a couple of polymorphisms that may increase the risk of developing BED, and these polymorphisms involve dopamine D2 receptor genes as well as the mu opioid gene that can influence the uh, risk of developing BED. And this interacts with the environment. You can have antecedents to the actual binge eating that includes a negative affect, interpersonal stressors, negative feelings related to body weight and shape for about 40% of the people with BED do have that issue. 
and uh, boredom as well. Uh, so there are lots of particular antecedents, and if you're prone to it, that may happen. And it's common. And it is common. And up until recently, when we talked about how common it was, we relied on data from the National Comorbidity uh, Survey Replication. This was the Hudson et al. Uh, seminal paper um, back in 2007 in biological psychiatry. And, and that estimate was that perhaps 2.6 uh, percent of United States adults might suffer from BD at any given time. Uh, my colleagues and I have recently uh, conducted a new epidemiologic study with a much larger uh, sample of over 36,000 uh, United States adults that were uh, selected to be, again, uh, representative of uh, the United States population. And uh, it is common. It is not as common as we, we were a bit surprised. So we came up with an estimate of 0.85% among U.S. adults. Uh, so uh, that's a lot of people out there. Uh, it's not a runaway number as some uh, people had uh, anticipated with the changes in the DSM-5. Um, this study found that BD is the most common formal uh, eating disorder diagnosis. It was more prevalent both in terms of uh, lifetime and current uh, estimates. It was more common than bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa. Uh, it is more common in uh, women than men, but the gender disparity is much less striking than what we see for the other eating disorders where there is an overwhelming gender um, disparity um, of women uh, to men. So it's important uh, for people and clinicians uh, and public health uh, individuals to not for lose sight that this is a disorder that affects both men and women uh, at, uh, at high rates. The other important thing from a, uh, a medical and from a treatment-seeking perspective is that BD is associated uh, strongly with severe obesity. Uh, we had an odds ratio of about 4.6, which is a, um, an impressive odds ratio uh, with severe obesity. That, by the way, is nearly identical to the previous uh, National Comorbidity Survey replication. Not quite as high as what the uh, World Health uh, Organization Mental Health survey found uh, with 12 or 13 um, other countries at a 6.6 .6 odds ratio. So it is associated uh, with severe obesity. But from a clinical perspective, it is important to realize that many people who are struggling with BD may not yet meet criteria for obesity. They may not yet have put on uh, the excess weight. And at the epidemiologic level, it, roughly half, pe half of people are, are uh, not quite uh, obese. So it's important to look for this disorder and consider its potential presence across the entire uh, weight range. So this is actually very important to understand. If you work in a bariatric clinic, of course you're going to screen for BED and you're going to find it more often than other settings. But you will have patients with BED who may be normal weight or just a bit of overweight, particularly if they're younger and are able to expend the energy to uh, dispel some of the extra calories that they, they take in. So it is important to ask about eating behaviors, even if you know, it doesn't seem to be likely an issue. And I incorporated in my practice, and we'll talk about this a bit more in, in a few moments, when I ask about appetite, and everyone asks about appetite, right, when doing a psychiatric evaluation, uh, you know, how's your appetite? Have you gained or lost any weight? I had another sentence, another question. And, you know, by the way, while we're talking about eating, have you ever lost control over how much you're eating? Just throw that in, and I think you'll be amazed on how many people will endorse that, and it opens up a whole different conversation about what to do. And, you know, BED is an equal opportunity yep. disorder, so I don't restrict it to, you know, someone who's obese or not obese. You know, everyone sort of gets that, that screen. What about ethnic racial groups? Well, again, there, uh, the data suggests uh, it's, it occurs in uh, diverse groups, uh, in people of color. And this goes against a lot of clinical law where eating disorders are supposedly, you know, a white young female problem. And, if, uh, and, that, and that clinical law uh, persists. Uh, data clearly show uh, that men and women uh, struggle with this problem and that people from different ethnic and racial groups suffer from this problem uh, at surprisingly or strikingly comparable rates. So it's important to look for it and consider it in everyone, and including all age ranges and including all uh, weight and, 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 and shapes. Yeah. Um, be surprised 
and a person might actually be relieved if they are, in quotes, whatever one might consider normal or average weight or what people might consider objectively attractive and so on and so forth, and you ask them that question, and if it's asked in a respectful and straightforward manner, you will occasionally come up with the person being relieved to share with you that this is something that they have uh, struggled with, and they're glad that somebody asked them about it. And yeah, they've struggled with it for years. Yeah. I mean, the mean persistence of BED is close to two decades. Yeah. So it's an invisible disorder. It's secret. Spouse and children are often completely unaware that it's going on. It's shameful. Patients don't want to bring it up. It's unknown to patients because they've not heard of it. You know, it's relatively new in our DSM, and it's under-recognized by clinicians as well. So here's a, a very interesting and actually shocking uh, study. An internet survey was done with over 20,000 respondents. 344 actually met the DSM-5 criteria for BD. That was 1.5%. So not everyone who was surveyed has BD. It's a small number. But of this uh, group of 344 people with BD, only 3.2%, only 11 of, them, 11 of them, had ever been diagnosed with BD by a healthcare provider. So what about the 97%? Yeah. And these so, are people that actually have been working with clinicians, many with good relationships for a long time. Yeah. So what is happening here is that we all have patients with BED. It's unrecognized. They come to us for treatment of their comorbidities. So we need to make uh, asking kind of a routine. Yeah. And this could be done seamlessly. And we, we've talked with... Uh, a lot of clinicians in different, uh, in different specialties, and many indicate that they don't have too, too much comfort in addressing issues around weight. They're not sure about language. They're not sure about the sensitivities of inquiring or, or pushing or asking about something that might be embarrassing, and therefore they, they, they don't do it. And it actually backfires because I think patients do uh, want and they, uh, to engage in these kinds of discussions, and they just may not know uh, how to do it, and they may not know that they have a problem. So our suggestion is the same way that most of us are comfortable in screening for other things, such as, you know, have you had a weight change? Is there a change in your appetite, either down or up? Is there a change in your sleep, either down and up? Because those things are so important to help guide our assessments, our interventions, particularly if we're using pharmacotherapies. Um, along with the appetite, you could just ask another question, as simply as, as you suggested. You know, uh, are there times that your eating feels different? Are there times when you ate that you felt out of control? And those things can be done very seamlessly with the other things that we're already so good at doing. And you actually did a study on, on how to ask, what words to use, what words to avoid. Take yeah. us through that. Well, we, we did a couple of these in community samples and clinical samples, and this is just one of them. And we basically asked people what words or what terms would, uh, do you prefer to use around your weight, around your shape, and around your overeating, and around your binge eating. And what we found uh, were very strong preferences and very, very strong non-preferences. Some of the safest words to use are things like weight. You know, I'd like to talk about your weight. Uh, around the binge eating, what are some of the, you know, uh, I'd like to talk about some of these times that you um, are, feel like you overeat and it's hard for you um, to control uh, what, what you're eating. People have strong non-preferences for things such as fatness, obesity, uh, your heaviness, your large size. Um, and what we, when we followed up with, with, with people, they often shared with us that regardless whether it's our field of mental health and psychiatry or endocrinology, that it turned them off to the clinical interventions. They were less likely to listen attentively to what the healthcare provider uh, then proceeded to suggest, recommend, prescribe, how to follow the regimen. They were less likely to come back for the follow-up appointment. They were less likely to seek other treatment and other preventative care. So regardless of the suggestions that we have here, which came directly from people, if, you, if you're not sure, the simplest way is to ask. Ask your patient, we're going to talk about your weight and your eating. In order to do that, what, 
what terms should we use? What language would you like to use? So miscommunication can really get in the way of a good evaluation. And, and if we actually uh, you know, focus on things that patients are embarrassed about and feel ashamed about, we're not going to get very far. Uh, so one of the other aspects of all this is what are our goals here? Our goal is not you know, simply weight-related issues. It's really to get at the binge eating behaviors, the emotional impact and the triggers that are involved here. This is what patients need some help with. And if we focus too much on weight, we'll miss the big picture. And the eating is very distressing to them. And that, puts, that should put into perspective uh, the significance of the eating uh, to our patients because uh, having excess weight in our, in our culture is, is certainly stigmatizing and you ask almost anyone, of course they would do almost anything to reduce their weight. So, you know, there's almost this normative discontent, if you will. But when you are working with someone with binge eating, the eating and dis these eating episodes are so terribly embarrassing and so terribly distressing, even within the context. So that's the connection, that's the opportunity to clinically establish a, a joint kind of, of set of therapeutic goals where you can define these behaviors. And fortunately, as we're going to move into, there are available treatments that can work very, very quickly. But going right to the distressing behaviors um, is really a, uh, it, it's one of the most effective things we can do rather than focusing on weight because they have had many, many years of many, many healthcare workers and physicians focus on the weight. Yeah. I've told you to lose weight. Why are you still... You right. Know? No one's ever asked them... <laughs> Have you lost control over your eating yeah. and what's happening yeah. when this occurs? Exactly. So I find uh, sharing binge eating disorder criteria with my patients very helpful as an educational tool. And they're often surprised to hear that I'm reading out of uh, the diagnostic uh, textbook. They feel very validated that these symptoms they're experiencing are quite real. They feel validated that this is a real disorder and they're more open to sharing their thoughts and feelings about this secret that they've been keeping to themselves for years and years. Right. And the language is very concrete, it's very behavioral, it's not stigmatizing, and it captures the things that they have been carrying around alone for so long. And it captures it without blaming and without using words that previous clinicians have used with them. And we have a screening instrument, too, yeah. that uses these criteria, yeah. right? Yeah, that's the other thing. There are uh, very quick screening instruments. This is just one example. There's the BED uh, screener 7, 7 because there are seven items. But the first item actually just gets to the point right away. It asks, you know, in the previous three months, have you had any episodes of excessive eating? Uh, it goes on to explain, well, by that we mean eating more than what most people would eat in a similar period of time. And that starts the conversation. If the person says no, it's, it's a skip out. If the person says yes, it goes on to ask about some of these things that we've already reviewed. They bring in a piece of paper to your session and the conversation is started. This is not the only screener, but this screener did pretty well. It's quick, it's easy, and um, I use self-report in addition to clinical interviews in my practice, not just in my research. It goes perfectly well. Yep. It can easily be incorporated. If you don't want to use the screener, if you ask, you know, that have you lost control over your eating uh, when you do your ordinary general inquiry, then you accomplish pretty much the same thing. This puts it in a, a more structured way and there's tear-off sheets you can leave around and so on. Yep. It starts conversations perhaps more easily. Uh, if a patient picks it up, looks at it, has some questions about it, they otherwise would not have asked these questions if they had not seen the screener. It's the comorbidities, though, that have typically brought patients to my attention. And then the BED, I need to take care to recognize it should it be there. So people coming uh, for physical or uh, psychiatric comorbidities, uh, it's a very common entryway for discussion about BED. So some typical physical comorbidities include sleep disturbances, pain, GI conditions, etc. Certainly anyone who's obese, you're going to ask these questions about eating, but also those who are normal weight or just a little bit overweight, 
if they have uh, comorbidities on this list, you're also going to really you know, pay attention here. And the psychiatric comorbidities are ubiquitous. Yeah. We see uh, increased rates of uh, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, substance use, misuse problems, attention deficit disorder, impulse control uh, problems. But in addition to those uh, comorbidities, uh, we have other uh, issues that should be considered. For instance, suicide appears to be, suicide attempts um, seems to be at an elevated rate, even after one adjusts uh, for uh, the contribution of the, uh, um, well, the contribution uh, of other uh, psychiatric uh, conditions. It's important to emphasize that the psychiatric um, comorbidity, uh, the elevated risk, and the distribution of these uh, problems at a, uh, at a heightened rate appears to be clearly due to the presence of binge eating. It is not uh, associated with increasing BMI or the presence of obesity itself. And that's one of the questions in the pretest, and you'll see it again in the post-test, not linked to the degree of obesity. It's linked to the psychopathology related to binge eating. And just to hammer down the point of how common psychiatric comorbidities are, four out of five people with BED have a psychiatric comorbidity, four out of five. And the ones that they have are your usual suspects, major depressive disorder, uh, some phobias, uh, perhaps PTSD. The lowest on the list here is OCD, which may sound surprising because one of the outcomes that is looked at in research with binge eating disorder is the Yale-Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale right. adapted for binge eating. But it is adapted for binge eating and it's focused exclusively on eating uh, obsessions and eating be, uh, actual compulsions. But OCD by itself is not all that common. No, it's not. Importantly, because, um, you know, a big issue that comes up, well, uh, so a person eats uh, too much, and they feel out of control so much, what's the significance? Well, we've already talked about, well, it's, a, it's clearly associated with heightened psychiatric comorbidity. It's, it appears to be associated with a number of medical and cardiometabolic uh, problems. But it's clearly associated with heightened levels of functional impairment. Uh, so this, even though this is a problem that often ha uh, people suffer in silence, if you will, uh, people clearly uh, are, uh, are distressed about it, but it also impairs how they get along with other people, how they do occupationally, how they do socially. Um, their, uh, their life impairment is quite important, so it really speaks to the massive public health problem that this uh, represents. Clearly not a benign condition, but uh, thankfully we have treatments, including both psychological and pharmacotherapeutic. And we're gonna give you a quick overview um, of the available uh, interventions uh, uh, that research has uh, pointed us to. We're gonna focus primarily on, on uh, pharmacologic uh, approaches, but it's important to have an overview of uh, the available uh, artillery, if you will, out there. Uh, past 15 years, we've identified a number of psychological treatments that have been tested in a number of uh, controlled trials. And uh, the message is fairly clear that there are a number of specific psychological treatments uh, that are effective, uh, in particular cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, and interpersonal psychotherapy, or IPT. Both of these treatment uh, approaches, and they are specific, manualized approaches. This is not, these are not, uh, well, let's talk about how you get along with people in the case of IPT, and in the CBT, it's amazing, everybody says they do CBT. CBT is a very specific, specialized approach to psychotherapy, and just giving your patients uh, record, uh, diaries to write something in does not make it CBT. Uh, but when these approaches are, uh, follow the protocols, what we see are uh, impressive reductions in binge eating and associated psychopathology over the short term. People uh, experience significant benefit and relief in as little as 12, 16 weeks of, of therapy, and research suggests that those improvements, which are quite robust in addition to being uh, statistically significant and superior to a variety of control uh, conditions, uh, are quite durable, and people uh, 
12 months, 24, and even 48 months after completing the treatments without additional treatments continue to do well. By uh, what the rates are, we can generally expect with those specific therapies, roughly 50 to 60 percent abstinence or um, remission rates that, again, are durable uh, well after the treatments are uh, discontinued. So the problem is obviously the other half. Uh, you know, a third to a half of people do not benefit sufficiently, even from the best available uh, psychological uh, treatments. Interestingly and importantly, with the, uh, both IPT and CBT and some of the other specialized treatments that do have some uh, effects, even though they're perhaps not as robust, such as DBT, which a lot of people do use for impulse control disorders and, and self-harming kinds of behaviors, as well as behavioral weight loss following a behavioral and a lifestyle intervention, uh, the, the problems with those is that you don't see much weight loss. And many of these patients uh, come into treatment with excess weight. The binge eating is, um, is stabilized or reduced, but they don't lose sufficient weight, which uh, really is, from a medical perspective, a continued uh, risk. People often are surprised, how can you stop binge eating and not lose weight? You have to remember that the binge eating and the treatment seeking led them uh, to seek treatment or to engage in treatment. And before that, they were probably gaining weight uh, at a very high level. It, recent increases in weight is another kind of behavioral sign or trigger that leads people to go to their health care providers for a variety of reasons. So even though they don't lose weight, those psychological interventions that work at least stabilize the weight over time. Um, but if it's stabilized and the person still has a, an elevated BMI, uh, they are at risk for a variety of cardiometabolic issues. So the, these psychological interventions do work. They're not necessarily accessible to everyone. So insurance doesn't necessarily make it easy for someone to access these interventions. And the community in which you practice may not have enough skilled people to actually administer these, these interventions. But they are effective, and you know, here's a meta-analysis. This is just one meta-analysis. Uh, it seems that every month there's a new one. This is actually a rigorous one published back in 16. There were some issues with this one as well. But uh, the interesting thing is regardless of the uh, details with the various meta-analyses that have been performed, remember this is uh, just fancy ways of putting together math, putting together numbers and weighting them and so forth. Uh, so if you put junk in, you get junk out. But interestingly, the various meta-analyses that have been uh, published in the past five years around uh, some of these psychological treatments, particularly CBT, have been remarkably consistent um, in, um, in their conclusions and that they are statistically and robustly significantly better than a variety of control conditions and even the error bars are well outside uh, what one would think could happen by chance. Yeah, so if you look at the number one and draw that vertical line from the number one, that's the threshold of, uh, of no difference. And these individual studies all were statistically significant and didn't cross over that one vertical line. So this tells me overall, you know, individual studies work and overall this is a pretty robust type of intervention. The problem this is many of us or live in communities where they are not, yes. uh, there are not sufficient numbers of healthcare providers trained in some of these approaches. Yeah. So an alternative and uh, uh, something that uh, you know, is more accessible is pharmacological interventions. There have been a number of different attempts to treat binge eating disorder with antidepressants, such as SSRIs, SNRIs, NDRIs. They can reduce binge uh, episode uh, frequency. They're not effective for weight loss. They can actually stimulate appetite, the ones that have been assessed so far. Anticonvulsants such as topiramate have also been used. They also, uh, topiramate can work, not only reducing binge uh, eating uh, episodes, but also uh, lead to some weight reduction. But they do have, uh, topiramate specifically, a negative impact on cognitive functioning. Anti-obesity, anti-anorectic agents have also been uh, used, and medications for addictive disorders such as naltrexone have been used. And I've, you know, basically tried them all with my patients with BD over the years. None are indicated for BD, and none actually, you know, were quite satisfactory. They either fall short in actually working or being tolerated or both. Now, we do have an FDA-approved agent for binge eating disorder called Listex amphetamine. It was originally approved for ADHD. 
It's currently the only agent currently approved for BED. And in late phase three of clinical development is desotriline, a dual acting dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, which we'll also talk about. But let's take a look at uh, the studies that support pharmacotherapy. At the top are the list X amphetamine studies. Each of the studies uh, were uh, statistically significant in terms of favoring treatment over placebo. None cross over that vertical line that represents one, which means no difference. Let's take a look at the bottom half of this slide, which looks at the antidepressants in a meta-analysis. And we see that actually very seldomly do we see, uh, and in fact, in this example, none of the studies that have looked at a specific antidepressant have demonstrated superiority over placebo that is statistically significant. Put them all together, though, uh, you do get statistical significance, but what's the use of that? Right. When you have a variety of these different agents and no clear signal for each of the individual agents. So I would say your mileage will vary tremendously with this approach, and you may be increasing someone's appetite to boot, at least in my experience, that's certainly been the case. Regarding Listex amphetamine, it's indicated for the treatment of moderate to severe BD, not indicated for weight loss. We need to assess for cardiac disease and risk of abuse before prescribing. St the recommended starting dose is 30 milligrams a day and titrated in increments of 20 milligrams uh, every week until you reach this target of 50 to 70. It's taken once in the morning with or without food and afternoon dosing is to be avoided because of the potential for insomnia. When we take a look at which adverse effects we can expect with this drug, well, basically anyone who's used stimulants uh, or prescribed stimulants, I should say, or, or both, uh, dry mouth is extremely common. In fact, 36% of people randomized to list dexamphetamine experienced dry mouth. About 7% of those on placebo experienced dry mouth, leading to a number needed to harm of four. Now, number needed to harm is a number that tells us how many patients needed to be randomized to, in this case, list dexamphetamine versus placebo before expecting one additional patient with a complaint of dry mouth. Well, it's only four. So this is something that we'll see all the time when using Listex amphetamine, and I warn patients about it, and I hope for the best. Decreased appetite is seen more seldomly, which tells me, you know, what I'm doing with Listex amphetamine is not altering appetite as my primary goal, because otherwise, you know, it wouldn't be all that successful. 12% of patients had that as an observation, decreased appetite versus 3% on placebo, number needed to harm of 11. It's seldomly encountered. So I find number needed to harm as a useful way of assessing the clinical relevance of an effect. And if the number needed to harm value is very high in magnitude, it's something that I'm not going to encounter very often. So for example, fatigue, which would be you know, paradoxical in someone receiving a stimulant, was seldomly encountered versus placebo with a number needed to harm of 162. I don't see that. No. What about maintenance? This is actually a very important study in, uh, in the field. And in the field of eating disorders, it's actually the, only the second controlled study of a maintenance uh, strategy uh, with pharmacotherapy um, for uh, an eating disorder. And this is the first such study for uh, binge eating. This was a uh, study reported by Hudson and his uh, colleagues in JAMA Psychiatry. And it addresses one of uh, a, a really common clinical question that, uh, uh, that we get asked. My patient had a benefit on, on this medicine, LDX or whatever. How long would you recommend that I keep that person on, on the medication? Uh, my patient asks me, should I go off? Should I stay on? I have to use my clinical judgment. Um, uh, but it's a very common question. This study um, actually addressed that with, uh, with LDX. Uh, they um, treated a large series of patients with LDX, people who showed a clinical response determined based on an algorithm protocol um, prior to the study, uh, which was pretty, a pretty robust one. People uh, got better. And then they uh, randomized them in a double-blind fashion to either uh, active LDX or to placebo. They followed them for a period of time afterwards and uh, they waited to see uh, whether people uh, relapsed or not. And there was a 
statistically significant and from a clinical perspective, a very robust difference between uh, LDX and uh, placebo. Continuing responders on LDX um, uh, reduce the risk for relapse to, down to the single digits, only about 3.7%. So if we're looking at the relapse rate for placebo, it was 32%. For list amphetamine, it was 4%. We can do the math and calculate a number needed to treat value of four. For every four patients who were randomized to continue to receive LDX versus placebo, you avoid a patient relapsing. That's actually a pretty strong That's a very good size. number. So those are the numbers to keep in mind. The NNT and the NNH really put together a, a, a nice benefit risk, but from an empirical perspective, uh, to, guide, uh, to guide this decision making. What about some tips? Well, again, the, the only NNH number of any significance uh, was really this dry mouth uh, issue. And dry mouth, the good news there is that it's not going to make anyone frightened. And if you could just let people know that that's really one of a couple of things that could happen if you're taking the medication. And well, maybe about a third of our patients uh, experience dry mouth over time. If you do, let us know. It's not a sign of a larger problem. It is something that we can come up with some behavioral uh, strategies and then you can work with some people around having water in a bottle, which is good for people anyway. We all walk around too dehydrated, perhaps have some um, you know, sugar-free gum every now and then, and, and then behaviorally help the person uh, through, uh, through that. Um, so that's really from the NNH uh, data. That's really the, the biggest thing that uh, I would, uh, you know, share with patients. It is important to let them know, uh, you know, with the other signs, you know, a loss of appetite, which only happened in what, about 12% of people. The good news there is if somebody has a loss of appetite, they'll let you know, but they won't be upset by that necessarily. And then some of the other ones are a bit more troubling and then you can work with people around, uh, for instance, if there's insomnia, trying to take the dose even earlier, better sleep hygiene uh, late in the evening, and those kinds of things to offset uh, some of these uh, problems. One of the biggest things to keep in mind of in your clinical management of patients is that LDX is not approved for nor indicated for weight loss or for the treatment of obesity. Uh, its safety and efficacy for those conditions and those uh, treatment aims are uncertain. They're not known. So uh, it's important that you let them know that the treatment is geared around the binge eating and the associated uh, thinking and behaviors around the binge eating. Um, the other thing, uh, it's important to monitor your patients very carefully for any patterns of or signals for misuse. Uh, particularly in anyone that you believe had a history of other substance misuse and even though you evaluated that and you were comfortable in the fact that they don't have a current problem, you decided to, uh, to try a, a, a trial with this medication, it is very important to make sure that they're, uh, you know, to check in on a very regular basis to see how they're doing with the pills, that they're not misusing them, that they're taking them as you recommend, uh, that, you recommend that they take them right, and no yeah. more they don't divert them. If they have a history of bipolar disorder, we want to keep an eye on that uh, so that if they feel more irritable or revved up, we, we worry about perhaps no. making that worse. In terms of the dosing, although the product label says 50 to 70 is the recommended dose range, remember that was evaluated in groups of people and we treat individuals and we have individuals who may get by with lower doses, although off-label, uh, this is the real world and Sometimes lower doses are better tolerated and work just as well. In phase three of clinical development is desotriline. It's a novel compound that's a dopamine norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. It's different from anything else that we've had so far. It's absorbed slowly, it has a long half-life, and you have pretty steady concentrations over the course of the day. It's being studied for both ADHD and BED and a number of different neurotransmitters that are uh, modulated by desotriline are involved in the pathogenesis of BED, so, so believed, and uh, makes sense that this would actually work. It turned out that in the clinical trials, it did work generally well tolerated, and the most common adverse events, 
were insomnia, dry mouth, and decreased appetite. In terms of the clinical trials that were done, there are two that I'd like to, to summarize for you. One was a flexible dose study where patients with moderate to severe BED were randomized either four to eight milligrams a day of desotriline versus placebo, and looked at were the number of binge days per week, the, the CGI related to binge eating, clinical global impression related to binge eating, the Yale-Brown obsessive compulsive scale modified for binge eating, and the four-week cessation rate from binge eating. So these are what was studied also in the Listex amphetamine clinical trial development program. And here I'll share with you the four-week cessation from binge eating results. 47% of the desotriline group stopped binging versus 21% of the placebo group. That's twice as many, but I like to calculate number needed to treat. So let's see, uh, what is 47 minus 21? Help me out here, that's 26, 26. Right? And that goes into the number 100, I'd say four times. Number needed to treat a four. This number four keeps on coming up. And uh, so this tells me a potentially useful intervention. The second trial was a fixed dose design, looking at six milligrams a day and uh, uh, eight, uh, well, uh, four milligrams a day and six milligrams a day and uh, comparing that with placebo, same outcome measures, and it was the six milligram a day dose that separated from placebo. The adverse events noted that uh, were evident in more than 10% in any of the dose groups were insomnia, dry mouth, headache, decreased appetite, nausea, and anxiety consistent with the prior study. There is a 12-week open label extension that will uh, provide more information about safety and tolerability. Recently presented were some behavioral outcomes, uh, such as uh, the uh, Yale-Brown obsessive compulsive uh, scale, as I mentioned before, for modifi modified specifically for binge eating. And also looked at was the eating disorder examination questionnaire and the Sheehan disability scale. So here is some more information about how helpful a drug is, not only just looking at the binge behavior itself, but the associated obsessive kind of thinking and compulsive behaviors as well as impact on, on disability. What about combination therapy? It seems to make sense to combine drugs, right? People ask us all uh, the drug, time. This is a difficult to treat yeah. disorder. Uh, shouldn't uh, we try a combined approach, a multidisciplinary approach, common sense? Um, there is surprisingly very little research on uh, this you know, critically important question. At last count, we were able to identify only seven studies uh, that uh, tested the combination of a medication being a war placebo uh, along with a psychosocial uh, behavioral or cognitive behavioral uh, treatment. And the results are perhaps a bit surprising uh, to many clinicians. Six out of the seven found that the combination uh, was not better uh, it did not significantly enhance the binge eating or the weight loss uh, outcomes. The one study that did find a statistical advantage to an active medication with uh, a cognitive behavioral treatment was topiramate. And the addition of topiramate versus placebo enhanced, uh, again, significantly. And in that one uh, study, it was a fairly robust advantage, uh, the reduction in binge eating, uh, as well as a reduction uh, in weight. But one out of seven studies only. One out of seven. That was a question, right? I think that, so. That most people got wrong. Right. It's one out of seven. We, we tend to think, oh, we'll get synergy adding right. uh, pharmacotherapy with psychotherapy, right. but not always so the case when we more is not always better. No. The correct one may be better than just piling on. Yeah. And to go back, uh, if you keep in mind this NNT of four for these two medications, um, those are very good numbers. And again, the, the broader context for this is a lot of these individuals uh, have had this problem you know, for 15 years or longer. So it is not a, a phase. It is not a transient hiccup. This is a persistent, durable problem associated with market impairment and both of those trials in 12 weeks were able to have such a profound impact on a sizable proportion of the patients who tried those medications, nearly half. And with an NNT of four, that's pretty darn good. Yeah.
So in the future, there may be a study looking at CBT plus LDX? There will be a study. Uh, I have uh, a new R01 from the NIH, your taxpayer money, and we are in fact doing a controlled study on CBT and LDX. Perfect. So let's summarize. BD is different in a number of very important ways from overeating. We all overeat. It requires the presence of very specific distinguishing characteristics uh, from overeating, most notably the loss of control, the marked distress, and the very strong feelings of shame and guilt around the eating. It is distinguished from other eating disorders such as bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa by the absence of extreme weight compensatory behaviors. It's important for us to realize in our assessment and in our treatment conceptualization and in our monitoring of how treatment works that psychiatric and medical and somatic and cardiometabolic problems uh, occur at high rates and uh, that this is not just a boutique problem. People with this uh, disorder uh, suffer in, uh, significant functional impairment, so it is a real disorder and people can benefit from several available treatments in a very short amount of time. Unfortunately, it goes undiagnosed and underdiagnosed. We have harped on this. Our hope is that just that you will uh, realize this in your practices, but that in your uh, communications with your peers, your colleagues, your trainees, your clinics, uh, your research programs, your clinical services, that you uh, share some of this information about what this disorder is about and how to, in a compassionate, non-stigmatizing manner, ask your patients uh, about it. In terms of distribution, let's not miss it. It happens in men and women. It happens across all age groups. It happens in people of color. So don't miss it by just focusing on people with certain narrow characteristics. And the good news it used to be, well, gee, what do we do once we have a label, once we have a diagnosis, other than the person feeling heard and understood that they're not uh, making something up, that they're... We now have a variety of pharmacologic and psychosocial options that are legitimate options and can help people who have suffered for a long time and it can actually help people in a very short amount of time. However, as healthcare workers, we need to point them in the right directions. Some of the medications that people are comfortable with out there, antidepressants don't seem to do a lot. Some talk therapies where we talk about all sorts of things don't seem to do a lot, but there are specific psychotherapies, there are specific medication options, and those are the things to review carefully with our patients and then customize the treatment and then monitor them carefully. So let's move on to our case-based discussion. Case number one is the failed diet. Case number two, like mother, like son. Case number three, the specter of body image. Case number four is more really better. So Jane is a 50-year-old woman with major depressive disorder. Jane is not her real name, but she's a real patient. She's been treated for the past 25 years for her major depressive disorder with really good control of her depressed mood. However, uh, this was not so easily accomplished. She responds to and tolerates only paroxetine. And I'll tell you, I tried everything, but this was the only one that actually worked out. She has increased appetite, is always hungry. She's gained weight gradually over the years despite diet and exercise. And it, I really was not clued into the idea that maybe she has an eating disorder. I was treating her for MDD. I had no idea that she was having disordered eating, and I should know better. Uh, she complained, though, that I am not able to lose weight even though I'm on a diet. And I assume, you know, stupidly, that it was only because of the paroxetine. I finally asked her if she have lost control over eating sometimes and maybe eating in secret. And then she tells me she binged every evening once her husband went to bed. And she had no idea that this was part of an illness. She was very surprised to hear that this was binge eating disorder. I went over the diagnostic criteria with her. She endorsed every single item that I mentioned. And then I realized, you know, BED and MDD don't necessarily travel together when it comes to treatment response. Carlos, your comments. This illustrates so many different things. Even uh, a therapeutic relationship that is a solid one, a long-standing one that's focused on a variety of important things uh, can miss something. Uh, but this is a challenge 
not just for BD. You can, might not ask your client, patient, if they smoke, if uh, there's domestic violence in the house. There could, so these are just complicated things. But in this particular case, once it was identified, it was a game changer. It, it was, was a game changer in so many different ways because you have to stand back and think of this person's life experience. The stereotypic thing from a societal perspective, an anti-obesity bias, is that, eh, she's overweight because she has no willpower, because she just eats, she just this, and da-da-da. And you know That what? stuff she, gets internalized. The yeah. person also believes that, I can't do this. And she wasn't even that overweight. Right. So it completely flew under the radar, and I should have known better, because yeah. I actively treat eating disorders yeah. and somehow I, I miss this one right. completely. But once the person begins to talk about it in this way, it becomes a behavioral problem. It is not about willpower. It is not about weakness. It is a behavior. And once you have the behavior, something concrete can be done about it and a change can occur quickly. So let's go on to the next case that was selected. The specter ah, of body Ah, Mary, uh, a 45-year-old African-American woman. She was a banking executive. She had a long history of weight fluctuations. So she would uh, lose weight, put on weight. She was a high-end executive, so she had all sorts of expensive clothing and all sorts of expensive wardrobes, uh, something I would not be able to do. But in any case, uh, long history of weight fluctuations. The way she put it, failed diets, my physicians, my internists would tell me, you need to lose weight and keep it off this time, Mary. Uh, you know, with the high stress that you have at work and all this extra weight, you're not going to live to see your grandchildren. That's what she was told over and over again. She was highly successful in a competitive banking field. And this is, you know, interesting um, and unfortunate and complicated. This is in a culture that... Um, you know, call a spade a spade. She had to overcome a lot of biases about her sex. She was a woman leading executive in her field. Um, she was a black woman and a leading executive in her field. And often um, she had excess weight. All of those things are viewed negatively to call a spade a spade, either implicitly or explicitly, yet she was able uh, to thrive at least in her professional area. She saw a recruitment flyer for a study at a university, i.e. mine, for concerns about eating behaviors. That's what I have, to, I'm high tech, I put flyers. Do you have concerns about your eating behaviors? She could afford all sorts of different docs and she had paid for all sorts of treatments from very expensive docs, so she came in for a free study that we do. And she learned that she had BD. Um, we tried some pharmacotherapy, my colleagues did. Um, she showed some uh, responses uh, and she relapsed when she went off the meds. When we started talking more in, in, you know, uh, with additional research studies and additional clinical evaluations, um, she talked about her weight and shape, and she revealed how they dominated how she felt. So this was a star in her community and her in her professional world. And you know what? This is when she broke down and said, you know, yeah, I make this amount of money. My corner office, I can see such and such. This is how much my portfolio is worth. I have a great family, and I cry often because when nobody's watching, this is what I do. And then this is how I feel about myself. And that makes me feel worse than all these, all these other achievements in my life. They don't mean much to me right now. That's how she talked about yeah. it. Sounds like a very insightful woman and who would benefit from a, a psychotherapy uh, in the context of having, you know, maybe not persistence with medication therapy. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to the next case. Like mother, like son. So Gino's a 25-year-old student in a biology PhD program at a prestigious Ivy League university, has been irritable and moody. His girlfriend urges him to go to the college counseling service. 
and at the first appointment talks about the stressors of his experiments not working out and that if he doesn't get back on track he will lose the entire year. He's thought to have a major depressive episode and placed on fluoxetine. But he remains unhappy, he talks about having an insatiable appetite as well, worsened by his antidepressant therapy and mentioned very casually that he has been eating just like his mother. Gino was never asked about the family history of psychiatric problems, which is surprising, but now after his casual remark, his clinician finally makes the inquiry and finds that Gino's mother has been treated over the years for bulimia nervosa and for non-purging bulimia, as he called it. That's when she was eating out of control but wasn't you know, forcing herself to vomit. And it's actually an old term that is akin to binge eating disorder non-purging bulimia. Fluoxetine was discontinued and an eating diary was started. Binge eating episodes were clearly noted. The clinician educated himself about BED and Listexamphetamine was prescribed. So this was new to the caregiver as well, but to his credit, he learned about it, learned about starting an intervention, a pharmacotherapy intervention. After two months of being on LDX 50 milligrams a day, Hey, guess what? Gino's mood was improved and his eating behaviors normalized. The eating behaviors were triggering his irritability, uh, triggering his mood disturbance. It wasn't the other way around. Right. So this illustrates so many, so many things. Number one, you could have a guy struggling with this. There is increased risk for some of the transmission of this in, in families. It's uncertain whether some of it is because of genetic or multiple genetic influences, or shared environmental, or a combination, or an interaction thereof. Then, you see the impact on this gentleman's life, on his developing life. A couple of things were tried. Once there's a real collaboration with the clinician and the patient, they come to a discussion, they come to a better understanding they arrive at a reasonable decision, which is, well, fluoxetine, which has so much value for so many things, isn't helping here. Let's consider something else. They let's tried. revisit the diagnosis. Yeah. yeah. The diagnosis says, well, let's try something else. If we assess, if we can define the problem, we have a better fighting chance of doing something about the problem. And then, this is also very, I, I think, uh, hopeful. Uh, for all of our patients. You have someone who has the deck stacked against them, if you will. My family has struggled with similar problems. So one would think that's a more difficult, a more challenging, a more resistant, it's in the body somehow, it's in the genes somehow. And yet, with a clear intervention, LDX prescribed at a appropriate dosing over time and monitored carefully, in a very short amount of time, there's a clear behavioral difference. Well, we have one more case, but we need to do the post-test questions, so whatever you put on the screen, I'll do next. I guess we'll do the case. Okay. <laughs> Is more really better? We touched upon this at the end of the academic review. Um, a 50-year-old woman, a history of recurring depression, anxiety, um, and a history of substance use problems that fortunately has not uh, re-emerged re uh, in the past few decades. Struggling with managing uh, several medical uh, conditions including severe obesity, metabolic syndrome, and pain. Uh, most of her appointments were with, uh, with endo. Um, and then uh, the presence of BD recently recognized by one of the providers on this multidisciplinary uh, practice and they started um, discussing what additional treatments. They were been so, you know, the medication regimens were complicated uh, to try to manage the cardiometabolic problems. The pain disorder uh, added, uh, as many of you know, additional complications, uh, both from a pharmacotherapy management perspective as well as from a, you know, a coping uh, perspective. Um, and the psychologist in the practice argued Given the complexity of the existing medications, uh, perhaps we should just focus on some behavioral strategies to address the binge eating, and perhaps some of them can spill over uh, to help manage uh, the pain without adding another medication uh, to the long list of 
uh, medications on uh, the regimen. Sounds very reasonable. If Jane is insightful and willing to do the work, then and I if think there's a provider yeah, nearby yeah, that yeah. can do the treatment, that's one of the advantages of pharmacotherapy. Is if you, a pill has the appropriate dose, regardless of the town you live. Yes. But you. So if you are a good prescriber and uh, you can manage the patient well, that's the tremendous advantage there. Theoretically, having a talk therapy, if there isn't someone in your community that does it. So the willingness to do the referral, but then the willingness to cultivate a list of appropriate referrals that you have confidence in that can actually deliver uh, the appropriate treatments. Yeah. So time for QA. We have a gentleman who's been most patient. Yeah, I have like three little questions. One was what was the dose with the tapiramate study? Uh, number two, uh, Stephen Stahl mentions in his pearls about zonisamide, perhaps help, helping binge eating disorder. And three, is there a role of fintermine anywhere? Well, we could do it in a variety of ways. Uh, fentermine actually, interestingly, is the most widely prescribed of the FDA-approved medicines for uh, obesity uh, in this country, uh, um, despite its relatively uh, limited uh, potency, if you will. It's also one of the most widely um, misprescribed uh, medicines. Uh, the 12-week limit seems to be ignored by most prescribing docs. Uh, it hasn't been studied um, in um, this disorder yet. I suspect it will not be. I suspect that the first test will be a uh, somewhat of a related one where I can imagine um, a fentermine to pyramate combination uh, being um, tested, and that would seem to hold more promise. Um, regarding the topiramate, uh, I'm embarrassed to say I have brain freeze right now. Uh, the, the study, um, uh, you can look it up at Susan McElroy, and there were a couple of um, uh, papers in, uh, I believe, the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. You can send me an email. Uh, I'll, I'll send you to dosing. Um, the, the trick with that is the up titration with that um, medication, it requires a great deal um, of skill, and the McElroy group um, was very comfortable with that medication, and, they, uh, and the outcomes were pretty uh, impressive significantly. In a clinical practice uh, reality, I think a lot of physicians have trouble managing their patients, getting the dosing up to that number that I can't remember right now, and I apologize. Yeah, it's not Again, a low number. It's, it's a number that you would anticipate having problems with with some patients. Right. So it is titrated to that number in order to make that uh, as easy as possible for the individual, yeah. but you often yeah. do run into some obstacles yeah. cognitively. Yeah. Zonisamide, I have no experience with uh, in binge eating disorder. Uh, I've tried a lot of different agents. Uh, that one, you know, didn't particularly. Yeah, and I have no up. experience with it. I take a wait and see on that one. I'm not so in, um, enthusiastic about it. Going back to the pyramid, one more um, empirical um, tidbit. To follow up on your your point, the McElroy then published a uh, open label uh, continuing treatment um, study uh, with the pyramate, and they found that it was nearly impossible to maintain their patients on the therapeutic dose. And in fact, uh, the withdrawal rate because of adverse events approximated 90 percent. So even if you can get people to that dose, it's hard to keep them on that dose. Uh, beyond a 12 or a 15 uh, week period. It's, it's very, very challenging, I find. On the other hand, it has other benefits. People like the fact that they lose uh, some weight. Uh, people with migraines seem to uh, benefit at a, I think, a surprisingly large percentage uh, of time. Uh, but it's a very challenging uh, medication. Yeah. So we much. have to vacate the room, but uh, if you want to approach us individually, I'm sure we won't object. I'm easy to find, uh, by the way, if you want to email me. Uh, Carlos is also extremely easy to find as well. First and last name. Yeah, and for me, it's nntman at gmail.com. Thanks so much. Thank uh, you so very attention. much. My pleasure.